And with that hymn, I don't know if you, you did, when we sing the very first uh, verse in the refrain, who took a look at the cross up here? Raise your hand if you took a look at the cross. Did anybody take a look at that? It looked like some people were looking at it when we were singing it, you know. And I think <laughs> somebody was talking, and I didn't see anybody's, you know, lips moving back there. <laughs> Something was going on uh, in the back. Oh, you know, uh, I couldn't help but thinking as we were singing the hymn, I shall know him. And I shall know Him. There's not going to be any doubt that we're going to know Him. But you know, were you actually envisioning taking the Lord by His hand? I don't know if you were doing that, but I was was envisioning that, and I was envisioning my own hands when I was doing that. There's not going to be any doubt that He's your Savior. And there's going to be evidence when you grab His hand that you're not ever going to forget it, that moment that He's got the nail print in His hand. And you know, at that point when we, get, when we actually get there, and I'm thinking of the time when we actually, you have to think, this is not if you die right now before the Lord comes, because that's your spirit and your soul that will be in His presence. It's talking about the time when you are going to have your new body. Because when you have that new body, you are going to grab your Savior by the hand. And you know at that time, how's my hand going to be? Whole, perfect, a body without sin. And be reminded that the only reason I can stand there is because of the nail prints in His hand. I don't know, that's what I'm thinking about in all the, when we're singing that hymn this morning, being, you know, I wanted to enter in when we started Sunday school, I wanted to enter into the throne room. I want to enter into that place where the Lord is and where we can stand. And I don't know about you, but in the way the Lord orchestrated those hymns this morning, He was able to take me there and be able to stand in the presence with my Lord and see that point in time. A little picture of it. Oh, just a little foretaste of what it'll be like to take Him by the hand and be reminded of what He did. We are looking at 22 commands that the Lord is giving us through the Apostle Paul in 1 Thessalonians 5. And there is not any one of us that's going to be able to hold on to those commands without see it, not seeing the vision of what we need to be able to see the Lord. Right? You need to be able to see your Savior this morning, don't you? You need to be able to enter into that throne room. If you want to be able to keep those 22 commands, you've got to be right there with the Lord. You know, Lee, Lee mentioned that our deacon meeting last uh, uh, Sunday kind of afternoon. Uh, Shelly and I are going to be gone on Sunday the 18th, and I let uh, Kurt and, and Lee know that and quite a bit in advance, so you, know, you can be preparing that, you know, man, I want you to come up and, and preach the Word of God right here, and, and Lee was, I could see it on Lee's count, Lee was, I don't know, I, you know, I might be hunting that day. <laughs> and, that, and that might be true, but I think the more he was thinking about how he was feeling his heart, I'm going to be hunting that day. <laughs> you know, I, I don't know if I'm going to. I don't know if I'm going to be there. I don't. I don't know if I'm. I don't know if I can come right here. And you know, a lot of that was because he told us. He said, and he, and he he shared it this morning. Where did he get away from? He got away from the word, didn't he? He got away from being fed by his Lord every day. And what did it feel like? How did he feel? Far away, didn't he? Far away from the Lord. But you know, 
he got right in to reading the Word this week. And what did the Lord begin to do? He began to, see, he shared a little. He, shared, he was sharing some of that on Wednesday night when he was here. And as he was sharing it, I'm, I'm, being, I'm going in my mind back to our deacon meeting where he said, you know, hunting. But the Lord was working a message even then in his heart, wasn't he? And that's what it is. Reading the Word of God. When we get in and we read the Word of God and we're studying the Word of God, I'm going to tell you, man, if you're doing it, if I called on you to come up here to get behind the pulpit, you ought to be ready. You ought to have some of the Word of God in your mind and in your heart that you could come and that you could share your heart from the Word of God and your relationship with your Savior. Being ready and willing to do that. I thank the Lord for those testimonies. I thank the Lord for what He's doing. And, and, and you know, I've entered that throne room, like I said, and that's the only way that I'm going to get strength to do what God wants me to do and what we're looking at right here in 1 Thessalonians. There is absolutely no way. We're going to look at something after lunch, and I'm going to tell you, there's no way that you're going to be able to do it on your own. There is no way. And there's some things that we're going to look at right here that you're not going to be able to do without being with the Lord and the power and the might that He gives in the Holy Spirit. It's the only way we're going to be able to do it. I'm going to come back here and pick up in uh, chapter 5. But the Lord is just putting that I need, we all need, to come together and pray for just a moment. There were some prayer requests that we had, and I want to pray for them right now because they're hard on my heart. So we're taking just a moment to pray right now, if you pray with me. Father, I want to come before you with my brothers and sisters. Lord, it's when we come in together in the power of who you are, Lord, in our lives. Lord, that you answer our prayers according to your perfect great will, Lord. And, and Father, I thank you for the vision, the, the picture that you've given us this morning to be able to come into the throne room. Lord, to be able to stand with our Jesus. To stand right there, Lord, where we can claim and we can pray. And we can claim all that is ours in you. Lord, we've got ones amongst us that are hurting. And Lord, uh, I want to raise up my daughter that's here right now. I want us to pray together, Lord, for her. Father, that your hand would be upon her. That the ailments and things that are going through her body right now, Lord, you would take away. Father, I know you have the power and you have the ability, Lord, being the great physician and the great healer, to do a great and mighty work right there. And Father, I, I ask, I plead with you, Lord. And I ask that you help along Kelly right now, Lord, where she is. Be upon her, Lord, with the might of your spirit, the might of who you are. And give her the peace and give her the direction, give her everything, Lord, that she needs right here, right now. And Lord, I think of Elaine that's here too, that's... Uh, as she come in, as she testified, Lord, not feeling real well. But yet she's here, and Lord, honor that. Be with her, Lord, in all the things that she struggles with, Lord, in this body. Lord, and help her, and, and give her relief from that, Lord, and give her an encouraged heart right now this morning to continue to praise you and to continue to give you glory and to continue to give you honor, Lord. Father, we want to lift before you too some that aren't here the Wilson family that's not here is are traveling Lord Marsha's birthday Father allow them to have a great day together with you worshiping you Lord adoring you and Lord I know a, a brother that's dear to us here Josh Lord who made a commitment to the Lord a few weeks ago in raising his hand wants to be praying for his grandma Dolly Lord and we want to pray for her life we want to pray that you'd get a hold of that life and that you would change her life, Lord, and her heart. Father, the Mats and family that's not here, Lord, not feeling well this morning too, and, and uh, just many things 
uh, pressuring upon them, Father. I pray that you'd lead and guide them. I pray that you give them the strength that they need in you, Lord, and to see that it's only in you. Father, be with them. Father, you want to lift up our, our brother uh, uh, Steve Cranford that's going to be gone this week, Lord. He's going to visit family and stuff, Lord. And I want to ask that you give him the, the ability, Lord, the power and the love for you to share with his family the most important thing that's ever happened in his life. And that's when he came to know you as his Savior. Lord, give him that strength and that boldness. Prepare the hearts of those people. Father, as we come before your word and we see the things that you have in it for us, God, give us the ability, Lord. Give us the, the, the energy, Lord, that we need to be able to accomplish the things that you're calling us to, Lord. You're calling us to higher commands, Lord. Those higher than even those Ten Commandments of the Old Testament. And Lord, we know that it is only in you and it is only in your, your spirit that, was in, that is in us, Lord, that can guide us in that avenue. That we can be all that you want us to be in Christ. Father, help us. As we look at your word, Lord, I know there's hard things. But help us to be what we need to be. In Jesus' name, amen. I always got to do a little bit of review and then get us to going, but um, I want to hit two things, and it's going to be commandment. I'm going to call it commandment eight and number nine. We've already looked at one through seven. One through seven. Real quick review of one through seven. Get you woke up, right? Anybody sleeping? Anybody getting a little drowsy? Oh, man, it's going to be bad for the second one, isn't it? It's going to be bad after we eat and we come back in. The very first command that we looked at was comfort. And that word comfort meant that when we got to come and encourage somebody. But I, I, I said this is the kind of encouragement I think that Shannon does. Where she comes along with some strength and you need to just be moved along, right? And you're ready and you're able to have that happen in your life. That's what that comfort is and that encouraging. I want you to see that. You've got to come along some people like that sometimes. And we've got to have the strength. And we're just moving them along, aren't we? Encouraging them in the Lord. And then the second command we looked at was the edifying. Edifying. Which meant building up on the foundation, right? Being a house builder. Not a house tear downer, but to edify. Isn't that what we were doing in our testimonies? We were edifying and building up one another this morning, weren't we, in our, the holy faith. So we need to edify and lift one another up. And then we looked at uh, the words. We kind of talked about those that were in leadership that we need to know who they are. Right? God's raised up the leadership in the church. He's raised it up in the family. And He's raised it up in the workplace. He's raised it up in the government. We need to esteem them very highly. Remember, I think if you were at the Sunday evening service, I kind of changed it up and I said, you guys need to supersize your pastor, right? You need to supersize your leaders, ladies. You need to supersize, guess who? Your husband, right? Supersize your husband in your life. Men, you like that? I kind of like that. My wife's not in here. Where's she at? <laughs> no, there she is. Oh, she's around the corner. She's checking on some of the food, I think. Supersize your husband. And then what does it do when we, we know and we esteem him very highly? There's a peace, isn't there? There's a peace in our life, a peace in our family, a peace in the church, a peace in the government, a peace in the world, if you want to say they can only come by the hand of God. And then uh, Sunday evening. We looked at warn them that are unruly. Warn them. That means you got to come alongside those that are unruly or those that are disorderly. And we got to tell them what they're doing wrong. Who likes to do that? That's easy for us to do, isn't it? Come along, yeah. Come alongside somebody and tell them what they're doing wrong. So we got to come alongside them, those that are unruly, disorderly. But you have to do it with a spirit of gentleness and love you know when we get to that point usually that gentleness and that love men when you got to bring your wives into account well maybe i should ask the ladies ladies how do I, how do how do the husbands come across sometimes 
Yeah. Brother, Brother Kurt answered it. Yeah. yeah, just like that, don't we? Maybe a little, little too forceful, right? Not in that gentleness. Not in that love. You know, if there's that gentleness and that love, there's probably going to be a difference on the other end, isn't there? There is. There is. I know there is. Right? Got to get myself to do it. Right? Come on, Lord, help me. Warn the unruly, those that are disorderly, and then comfort. We ended last Sunday evening with comfort the feeble-minded. Comfort those that are faint-hearted. And I, if you didn't get anything out of last Sunday evening, I hope you got a little bit about the balm of Gilead, right? Brother Kurt saying a little special kind of prompt. What do you, is it prompt to or how do you say impromptu or how prompt to? <laughs> he just did it for us. He came up and he blessed me with it. But the balm of Gilead, you know, we need to have that balm of Gilead. Those that are faint hearted, those that we have to come along and that balm of Gilead was soothing. Right? They wanted to get it from Gilead because it was medicine to help them in the healing processes. And we got to have the balm of Gilead. But we know that comes from, we sang another hymn, the balm of Calvary. The Lord Jesus Christ. We got to be able to come and put the ointment and soothe in people's lives. See, that comfort, that's the second time that word comfort was used, wasn't it? The first one was a little bit more power in it. This one's where you got to come. And you've got to rub the wounds a little bit, don't you? You've got to soothe the things that are going on in the lives of people. It's a little different, and that doesn't come easy for me. I ask the Lord to help me to have the balm of Gilead, to understand what that is, and to be able to come into people's lives and do it. Now let's hit the next one. We're on, see? We had 15 minutes of introduction or so, but now we're ready to go. Verse, uh, chapter 5, still in verse 14 now we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly, comfort the feeble-minded, and support the weak. Support the weak. What does it mean to support the weak? To keep yourself opposite from someone. Does that even make sense? Keep yourself opposite of someone. I want you to think of, I'll give you a couple illustrations maybe. Can you think of a, like if we had a big board in here? And it's leaning like this. If there's nothing on this side, what's going to happen to the board? It's going to fall down. But can we get another board? And can we prop it up on this side? And then what does it do? Does that board fall? Is it in an opposite direction of the other one? It is, isn't it? Or if you take a hold of somebody. I'm going to take hold of Josh. He's not going to get mad at me, I hope. If I take a hold of Josh. Now use Josh because his mom got to help him up sometimes you can get up by yourself sometimes too can't you though you can if we're gonna help josh then i'm gonna have to he's kind of there but i'm gonna have to push pressure upward right it's opposite of the way he is so we got to support those that are weak support means you might have to grab a hold of their hand you might have to grab a hold of their arm and what do you got to do? You got to work in an opposite direction of where they are. And you've got to lift them up. Whose strength, if, we, if you lift somebody up, or you have to get to that point to lift somebody up, who's doing most of the strength? <laughs> Josh got it right. He point to, he's pointed to his mom. More of his strength or more of mom's strength to get him up? Probably more of mom's strength. If she's walking in with Josh, he's got a belt on usually, right? Usually he has his cane. He didn't bring his cane today, right? Oh, you got it. Okay, you got the cane. You didn't have the cane, though, when you were walking in. And she's holding on to him. If Josh is going to go down, is it going to take a lot of strength for Connie to get him back up? It is. Why don't you just think that? That's the weak. Supporting the weak. It may, have to, it may require that kind of energy. Does anybody want to use that kind of energy to support one? Do you think it's going to take lots of effort? Maybe lots of time? Lots of effort and lots of time. Support the weak. I want to give you what, we, what the weak person is here. We got an illustration of what it looks like, supporting. But now, a weak person is this. Not necessarily where you don't have any strength to maybe stand up. 
But a weak person, and what the scripture's talking about here, is somebody that has a hard time seeing what's lawful and what is unlawful. You have a hard time maybe discerning between those two things, what's lawful and what is unlawful. It is also somebody that is weak. They're weak in knowledge and they're weak in faith. See, not necessarily physical, right? They're weak in knowledge, weak in the faith. And because they're weak in knowledge and they're weak in faith, what's very likely going to happen to them in life? Say it, Lee. They're going to fall, aren't they? They are going to fall. You're weak in knowledge. You're weak in faith. You are going to fall down. It's just imminent, isn't it? It's going to happen. You're going to fall. So what do we got to do? We've got to come alongside and what with them? We've got to support them. Do you like to do that? If somebody's weak in knowledge, weak in the faith, sometimes we don't want to come alongside and support them and to get them up and to help them. See if I can make us understand a little bit more maybe. I'm going to look at a couple other scripture passages here. From Romans chapter 14. And then it'll be one from 1 Corinthians we'll look at. Verse 1 in chapter 14 says, Him that is weak in the faith, receive ye him. Receive ye him. But not to doubtful disputations. For one believeth that he may eat all things, another who is weak eateth herbs. Now, why don't you think this with the, it says to support the weak. Weak in knowledge, weak in faith. But nevertheless, these people are Christian brothers and sisters. They've come to a relationship with Jesus Christ. They're just weak in the knowledge and understanding of the word and in faith. That's where they are in their life. And to, to understand maybe a little bit more, think of like the, let's think of the Jewish people for a minute. The Jews. They grew up with an educational system that taught them what? The law. So they've learned the law, the Ten Commandments. This isn't one of the Ten Commandments. This is a higher command, isn't it? They've learned the Ten Commandments. They've learned the law. They've learned the system and ritual and all those things. Now, Christ has come on scene. And things are different. And those people come, one of those comes, a Jewish person comes to faith in Christ and believes they're weak in what? Knowledge. And they can be weak in faith. And they want to enter back into what system? What they grew up in, don't they? Now, our educational system. I know there are people that are teaching education. Not speaking against. But our educational system. And it teaches us. I grew up in the educational system. And the way that it taught me was a world mindset of the world. It did not teach me any piece of this. The Bible. So you've got all that knowledge, all what we've been taught, right? You guys are being taught, right? All that that we've been taught. He shows us his hand. Is that where it came from? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, we got all that stuff, and one, one comes to believe in Jesus Christ. Now what do they got? What do they carry in? Everything that they've learned. Everything that they've learned. They've got that. And they're weak in the what? Knowledge. And they're weak in, but nevertheless, who are they? Christians, right? They've come to know the Lord. Haven't they? They have. Paul and I were talking about it a little bit just uh, on Saturday. How do you know? We want people to come in here to church. But when you come, you want to be pure. You don't want to have those sins and stuff in your life. So we're talking, well, at what point 
do you take a person that's here that's walking in sin and do we tell them you can't be here anymore? What about that new brother? That person that's just come to Christ. Remember, he's talked to the Thessalonians here. You turn to what first? You turn to God from what? Idols. But once you turn to God, you've got a whole bunch of idols and a whole bunch of garbage back here that you've got to deal with. So we got those people. Those are the ones that are the weak. We are to support the weak. They're brothers and sisters in the Lord, but they don't have the knowledge and they don't have the faith that we do. And you know what we want? When we've been in the Lord, I've been in the Lord for 20, almost 25 years probably, and I look at some new believer that comes along, and guess where I want them to be right now? I want them to be right where I am. I want them to know everything that I know right where I am so they can walk how they ought to walk. Are they going to? They, they're not going to right away, are they? Is it going to take some time in the Lord as they grow in the Lord? It is. So we got to see and recognize those people and support the weak, don't we? And that's what Paul's talking about here when we get to chapter 14 and we get to 1 first, first, uh, Corinthians. He says, Him that is weak in the faith, receive ye. Receive him. Receive him. He's a brother or sister in the Lord, but not to doubtful disputations. For one believe that he may eat all things, Another who is weak eateth only herbs. So one that's greater in the Lord here, or one that has grown in the Lord, is going to understand that he can eat what? Anything in the Lord. All things are declared in the New Testament what? Clean. Now a Jew from the Old, and it's kind of in the law, is he going to think everything's clean? No, he's not. He's going to struggle with that, isn't he? He's got, or maybe one that eat herbs, I think is what it says there. So now what do you do with one of those? I know that I can eat anything. But my other brother, what? He only thinks he can eat certain things. But I don't reject him. And what might he even try and tell me? You can't eat all those things. Because this is what it says. Is it going to take some time to teach him? It's going to take some time to teach him the word of God. To teach him what's true. So he knows what's true. Him that's weak in the faith. I want to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 8. Verse 7. Notice that other one said, Him that was weak in the faith. This one's going to say, Weak in knowledge. Weak in knowledge. Verse 7. 1 Corinthians 8 7 says, Howbeit there is not in every man that knowledge there's not in every man that knowledge that you've got right now in the lord for some with conscience of the idol unto this hour eat as a thing offered unto an idol and their conscience being weak is defiled but meat commendeth us not to god for neither if we eat are we the better neither if we eat not are we the worse but take heed lest by any means this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to them that are weak. Now, what was going on? They're talking about meat offered to idols, aren't they? So, they would have these people that would offer all this meat to idols. And then, you know what a lot of ha happened to a lot of this meat that was offered to idols? They got their hands on it and they sold it in the marketplace for a good price. Who wants a good price on meat? Right? If you're a shopper, don't you want to find a good price? You want to find... So there was Christians, Christians going to the marketplace. Guess what meat they were buying? It's the meat offered to what? Idols. Because it was at a better price. They understood that they could eat it. They understood where it came from. They weren't offering it to idols. They weren't worshiping idols. They were bringing it home to their families because it was... A better price for their family. And they were going to sit down and they were going to pray to their God and they were going to eat it. But now if there was somebody that was weak in the faith, saw them doing that, they go to the marketplace buying the meat that was sacrificed to idols, what are they going to think? Well, maybe it's, they're, they're worshiping this. So I go and buy it and it leads them astray, doesn't it? It leads them, because they don't have the knowledge. They don't understand. They're weak. They're weak in the faith. And he says there in verse 9, but take heed lest by any means this liberty of yours 
become a stumbling block to them that are weak. There was liberty for Paul to eat it, wasn't there? But he, he makes something very interesting here, I think. He says, for if any man see thee which has knowledge, right, the one that knows, sit at meat in an idol's temple, shall not the conscience of him which is weak be emboldened to eat those things which are offered to idols? So he could even go to the idol's temple, eat the meat, and understand that he's not worshiping anything. But if anybody saw him do that, what are they likely to do? Go and do the same thing and follow in the same manner as he's doing. And though, and through thy knowledge, verse 11, and through thy knowledge shall the weak brother perish for whom Christ died. But when you sin so against the brethren and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. Wherefore, if meat make thy brother to offend, I will eat no flesh while the world standeth lest I make my brother to what? Offend. Paul takes liberty. And I, I've, I've spoke this quite a few times here, and I want to speak it again. Because in Christ, you have a lot of liberty. We call it Christian liberty, don't we? And you know what? Because of my Christian liberty, I can do all those Christian liberties if I want to. I can, and I can. But you know what you take the chance to do? If we enter into all that Christian liberty that we have to do, what could happen to one weak brother or sister in the Lord? What could happen? Lead them astray. And they could fall. Just like that. Just like that. We don't want to use our Christian liberty as an occasion for a weaker brother to fall. And do you know, do we know of all those circumstances out there? Do we know of all those weaknesses? Do we know of all those things around? We don't know all those things necessarily. So Paul's saying he loved his brother so much to say no to some liberty. He said, I won't do it. I'm not going to do it. I'm going to get, Paul was speaking about alcohol a little bit. I'm going to speak about alcohol a little bit. He shared his heart. I want to. I'm going to. I want to share just a little. Just a little picture about the same thing. Now, we could probably argue back and forth, or we could debate Scripture back and forth, whether or not there is liberty to drink alcohol. Being a Christian, I think you can pull scriptures out of both hats. But I think you can pull it out of both sides to stand and, and come together and prove your point. I think you can. But you know, when I hit a scripture like we just read when we began this section, what did that word sober mean here? Somebody tell me. Don't I mean abstain from wine. And that abstain to me means if you want to do what God wants you to do, you want to be able to do the 22 commandments that are here, he says to do what? abstain from it do not do it now if you're on the side that there may be some liberty there as long as you don't drink to what drunkenness right as long okay i can have a few drinks but if i don't drink to drunkenness there's no sin in it but let's say we take it and we've got a weak brother we've got a weak sister and i have the knowledge i understand by faith that I can have a drink of alcohol, not be, not be drunken, and I can be okay. I can be okay. But now, a weak brother hears it, doesn't even have to be there, he hears about it, or he sees it. What might he think in his mind? Because I'm a Christian, a uh, uh, maybe a mature Christian in the Lord, what's he going to be apt to do? Possibly partake of it. And what if that brother, that sister happens to have a problem with it? And it leads them into sin. Right? What Paul's saying, I understand we could say liberty, but Paul said, I don't want to take that liberty if there's an opportunity for a weaker brother to fall. It's not worth it. You know why it's not worth it? Because I love you 
a whole lot. And it is not worth it. It is not worth it for one that we love to fall. It's not worth it at all. It isn't. I want to be on Paul's side with it. I want to say, I don't want to, I don't want to have that opportunity. That's just one example. The meat offered to idols was another example. I think we can come up with other examples in our life, can't we? Liberty that we have in things that we can do that can affect other people just like that. You know, he brings it actually to sin. And I want you to see this. Verse 11 says, And, and through thy knowledge shall the weak brother perish for whom Christ died. But when you sin so against the brethren and wound their weak conscience, you sin against who? Christ. So an area of liberty becomes an area of what? Sin. An area of liberty that became an area of sin. And we don't want that to happen. And the Lord doesn't want that to happen in our lives. Wherefore, I love 13. Wherefore, if meat make my brother to offend, I will eat no flesh while the world stands. While the world stands. I will not while the world stands, lest I make my brother to offend or my brother to fall. Don't take the chance. Don't do it. You know, I was reading something this week and, and it made a good point. You know, I... I think Harlan and I were even talking about it when we went to coffee on Friday. That he was sharing an example from his life and he was kind of vacillating. He remembers what it is. He was kind of vacillating back and forth. Well, should I or shouldn't I? If you get to that point, what do you say? No way. <laughs> if I got to do, do that, no way. No way am I going to do that. Right? I'm going to be on the safe side. I'm going to be on the safe side of that. I'm not going to do it. The scripture was that we're reading support the weak. That means we have to do everything that we can do to lift up that weak person. And in all those areas of liberty can be an area that they fall through. And we do not want to be accountable for that because you are. Whether you, maybe you're in a restaurant, you have a glass of wine, and a brother or sister comes in and sees you, and you don't even know they came in and they saw you, and they fall through it. You know what the Bible says? You're guilty of that. You have contributed to that. You have. Don't take the chance. Don't take the chance. And let's look at the last one, and then we got to eat lunch. You hungry? <laughs> John, yes, we're hungry. We're hungry. And then the last one, after we get done with lunch, it's going to be hard. I mean, we're going to hit some things. Gonna, it's going gonna, it's gonna to really prick your heart. It really is. going to hit you hard. But here it is. Be patient toward all men. Be patient Toward all men. The be patient part is when people have come at you and they have injured you and they have hurt you in your life. Does anybody feel that right now? Anybody feel injured? Anybody feel like you've been hurt by someone in your life in some way? I, you know, everybody should have raised their hand. You really should. There is something in your life where you feel that you've come, somebody's injured you and somebody's hurt you through some means in your life. Through words, whatever it was, it's happened to you. And when he says, be patient, he's talking about those things right there. When somebody, Shelly, are you praying for patience? When somebody, when somebody comes, my wife said she doesn't pray for patience because God challenges her with it so she just doesn't pray for it but be patient right those are these people that have come and done these things to us be patient that means you've got to what a little bit i've got to take a little bit of that don't i i've got to take a little bit of what they've said about me lee had to do that this week didn't he he, he testified there was things that came out in the paper at the college about who 
Not about me. Not about you. But it was about our brother right here. It was about him. I probably, I didn't read it, but probably attacking his character or how he did those things. Right? There was an attack against him. It was. There was somebody trying to injure him. What did the Lord tell him he needed to do? Be patient. Be patient. Lee, when you came into Wednesday night, were you still feel, were you patient right off the bat when you came in? How were you feeling in your spirit when you came in? Wednesday night service. Felt patient. He felt though he wanted to be with who? Brothers and sisters. Because he knew there was some strength. And he was relying on some strength and the power of our prayer together, isn't there? God can give us that strength. He was challenged with it. He should have preached this message because it's in his heart, right? He's been, he's been challenged with it. Be patient with him. And you get the word that says toward. See the word toward? Be patient toward who? All men. In the toward part is when the things happened to Lee, what could he run with? Could he attack back? Could he, he had words that went right back to defend himself? Words that went, words that went, words that went, right? He could have done it. That's the toward. Is what we take in when somebody, when somebody inflicts us, somebody injures us like that, the toward is as we react back with words or things that we say about them. Did anybody act like that this week? Anybody? So got some thinking. Where somebody, it can be even a spouse, right? One of the spouses kind of reacted like that. How does the other spouse react back? Ladies, were you patient with your husband all week? Husbands, were you patient with your wives all week? Or was there, did you feel, could you feel a little, a little bit? Of, I went to Billings yesterday. You know what happens to me when I go to Billings. <laughs> just, a, just a little bit of that, be patient toward your wife. Be patient toward your wife. Be patient toward your wife. Be patient toward all men. Not just Christians. That means every person, evil person, a wicked person. The whole gamut. He says, be patient toward all men. You know, I can't do that. I can't do that. I can't do that, Lord. I can't support the weak. I can't be patient toward all men. I can't. And he says, I know you can't. But like Lee said, what did Lee say? Didn't you love it? He said, he's already walked that way. The Lord's already done it, hasn't He? All i got to do is get on His pathway. And I can do it when I'm on His pathway. But if I'm off His pathway, I can't do it. Get on the pathway of the Lord, right? we got to get on the pathway of the Lord. That's the only way we're going to be able to do these things that He's calling you and I to do. Because when you're patient with all men, what does your wife think? Husband, or the opposite. What does the, what does the wife, what does the husband think back and forth when you're patient with one another? Ladies, do you know what to do to your husband to, to jab him a little bit? Do you know what to say? Megan laughed a little bit. She knows. She knows. She knows what, and men, do you know what to do to jab your wife a little bit? We do. We know exactly what to say. We know exactly how we're to react, and you know what they're going to do. Uh, you know, if we're patient toward all men, not just spouses, kids, those that are our enemies. Do you got any enemies? Enemies. Be patient. When we come back after lunch, we're going to look at verse 15. And it is this. I'm going to read it to you. It says, See that none render evil for evil unto any man. Goes a little bit with what we were talking about, but we're going to take it to another depth. 
render. See that, that none render evil for evil to any man. So come back after lunch. Try and keep you awake through. It might be hard. It probably will. We'll keep it a shorter message. Though. We went along this morning with everything that we had. But Lord, you are the only one that can help us be what we need to be. And I tell you, I want to support the weak. And I want to be patient to all men. Because through that, we witness through Christ. Lee was patient with all men this week. Did we see a response to his obedience to the Lord with the lives of two ladies? There was. One person called him on the phone. The other person, I think, came in to meet with him in his office. Two ladies responded to his patience. Patience. If he would have reacted any differently, that would not have been the same response. God makes big things happen for him when we're obedient to him. Lord, he wants us to be obedient to these. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for your word here, Lord. And I know that each one, I don't just speak from my own heart, and I know why you've written this to us, Lord, because we need to hear it. We need to understand, Lord, that we need to be patient toward all men. Lord, we know that we, we, you want us to be able to support the weak, Lord. Our weak brothers and sisters that are in the Lord, Lord, that don't have the knowledge and don't have the faith that we do. We need to come alongside them, Lord. And we might need to take the strength and pick them up, Lord. You know, we can't do it alone, Lord. We want to walk away from that because it's going to take a whole lot of strength and a whole lot of time that I just don't want to take. Lord, help us to be about your people. Help us to be about the edifying and the building of the house, Lord, and doing what you've called us to do. And Father, we want to ask a blessing upon our meal too that we're going to have here, Lord. I thank you for those that have brought the things here, Lord, for us to share. Lord, what a great... What a great opportunity for us, Lord, to share the things that you've given us with one another, to eat together, to fellowship together, Lord. And we just raise it to you. We thank you for it and bless our fellowship time. Bless our meal, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.